failure in the way I think about it is a midpoint, not the end point. I'm going to share three segments from my life where, uh, as I reflect on failure, these were very memorable failures for me. The first was, picture myself as a third grader. We had just moved from Iceland to the United States, and I was the whitest kid you could imagine down south. I did not fit in. I didn't really know how to fit in. And while my first report card had all S's for satisfactory on the academics, I had the equivalent of an F, a U for unsatisfactory, in what was called show and tell. I don't know how many of you had to do show and tell. I was supposed to bring in an object to show to everybody and stand up and tell about it. And I dreaded show and tell. I used to fake stomach aches, hide my object, lose my object, everything I could to get out of show and tell. One day the teacher said, Rosalind, you are getting out of your desk and you are telling the class about something even though you didn't bring anything in. In fact, she had called my mom to make me bring something in. My mom said, oh, take this little candle in and call it a taper and show it to everybody. And I had managed to hide it under a bush on the way in once again. <laughs> this time, I was forced out of my desk, and I stood there in front of everybody. And it, the silence was deafening. I could just hear my heart beating. And then the laughter started. And the laughter started quiet, and it got louder. And I just imagined growing humiliation until I realized that they weren't looking at me. They were looking at a little something that had just started walking across the floor. It was the funniest little thing I'd ever seen before. It had all these legs. It was a giant centipede. And they were looking and pointing and laughing at the centipede. And for the first time in my life, standing in front of everybody, I felt like I could relax. It wasn't about me. It was about the centipede. And I was able to mumble something about the centipede. They clapped. I sat down. And I was so relieved. I had just passed my first show and tell. Uh, and um, also, I guess, my first impromptu public speaking. Now, it wasn't about me. And reminding myself over and over when things are really so scary that I'm doing everything I can to not be bold and go into them uh, is a very powerful help for me in getting past uh, big, big failures. Segment two. I went off to Georgia Tech. I loved college. I loved studying electrical engineering, computer engineering. I loved the technical stuff so much, I took all of my for fun electives in nuclear astrophysics and stellar evolution. Uh, I really was in my element. In fact, I loved it so much that I didn't sleep. Uh, since then, we've done research on sleep at MIT, and those MIT students actually sleep, uh, on average, more than seven hours. And if you sleep on average more than seven hours and have regular sleep, you have much better mental health, morning alertness, happiness, and, and other features, like you're probably nicer to be around. <laughs> I wasn't that nice to be around. <laughs> uh, and I didn't realize what I was doing to myself. It's like I wasn't, uh, it's not that I thought I was invincible. It's that I just didn't think. Uh, I didn't think about what I was doing to myself. And fortunately, I had an amazing roommate and great friends uh, who used to meet and gather from very diverse backgrounds to study the best-selling book of all time. And so best-selling that it's not even on the bestseller list because it would be number one every week. Uh, so we would meet and study the Bible. And in that, I found great challenge, wisdom, and inspiration that allowed me to uh, start thinking more of others before myself and also start taking care of myself. And that made a big difference. And while I still try to read it and I fail at uh, implementing a lot of what it recommends, I find great peace and inspiration and joy in those attempts uh, that help me through a lot of challenges today. Fast forward, third segment. Third segment is I'm struggling to finish my PhD at MIT. I had gotten married at this point, uh, and my husband used to say, be polite, never ask somebody how many years they have before they finish their PhD. <laughs> Toward the end, 
you know, everybody's getting their papers accepted, mine's rejected. Uh, but I finally, you know, I just always felt like there was too much to do and I couldn't get it all done. I uh, was, it was suggested by my faculty advisor that I apply for a faculty position at a nearby uh, Ivy League school. I thought that was pretty cool. I applied, rejected so quickly. They didn't even give me an interview or a uh, job talk. I said, fine. I'm perfectly happy not even thinking about applying for a job because I have a lot of work to do. I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to finish this thesis. And then they invited me to apply at MIT. And you can probably tell from my title that I made it to that job talk uh, and have been at MIT on the faculty since 1991. Now, I wasn't so happy later when I made it all the way through. I, I was happy when I made it through tenure, but when I got promoted all the way to the top, they told me I was the first woman in the school to get promoted from the bottom to the top. And honestly, that was kind of disappointing. Uh, I think that should not have been the case. But there were a lot of challenges to get where I am today and a lot of struggles. Uh, for example, when I was getting started, uh, I was challenged by Jerry Wiesner, one of the former presidents of MIT and science advisor to John F. Kennedy, that he said the most important thing you can do as pre-tenure faculty at MIT is to take risks. Now, I thought I had liked to skydive. I had become quite a risk taker. Uh, but in my academic career, I was really worried about being accepted, about being respected, about being a woman in engineering who people took seriously. And I uh, was you know, sticking to being sort of the most mathematical person in my area, thinking at MIT that's what works to be taken seriously. As I took his uh, challenge to heart and our group rearranged to be the perceptual computing group, I started reading outside of my computer vision mathematical modeling work into work on how the brain works to perceive lots of other information. And I read a book about a man who tasted shapes. When he tasted soup, he felt points in his hand. Uh, this chicken soup didn't have enough points, so he'd add more seasoning and feel when it tasted right. And I was intrigued by this, because we were trying to figure out how, one, how we could build a computer that worked like our brain to perceive information. And in the studies of synesthesia, this union of the senses, Richard Saitoic, the author of this book, found that the key activity, the heightened perceptual activity, was not happening in the visual cortex or the auditory cortex, these regions of the brain that we were trying to build computers to represent. It was happening deeper down, subcortically, in a region of the brain involved with memory, emotion, and attention. And I wanted to learn more about this uh, and I knew memory and attention were important. I did not want to have anything to do with emotion, right? That would be the kiss of death for all of my serious <laughs> effort. First, I don't know who's laughing, but they must know that I went on to um, unfortunately discover that emotion was, uh, there was lots of great neuroscience showing how important emotion was, not just for perception, but for just about everything I had been looking at in AI, for decision making, for action selection, for language, for if you wanted to build a robot to interact socially with people. Emotion seemed to be a very important missing link. Now, I thought, OK, I'll get some guys to work on this, <laughs> men working on emotion. That will be taken more seriously. One failure after another after another. I remember talking to a colleague, very respected um, speech signal processing person who, you know, in engineering, if you're extroverted, you look at the other person's feet. And he was looking at my feet, and he was saying, Rosalind, don't waste your time. Emotion is a waste of time. It's just noise. And I gave some arguments why I thought it wasn't. And on and on, and I tried to convince people. And, they, uh, and the laughter of my third grade experience um, was not directed at the centipede this time, but at the topic that I was proposing. I uh, wrote a paper on it, submitted it to a more visionary journal, and it was rejected with the most humiliating reviews I've ever read. They said it read like a flight magazine. I then started to do, finally we were starting to get some real data and real objective measurements. I wanted to bring real engineering rigor to this topic, and we started doing measurement there. 
that uh, led to some real mathematical papers that were more in the vein of what I was used to. Submitted it to the first conference uh, on pattern recognition, and it was rejected there too. They said it didn't fit this conference. Uh, they forgot they had pattern recognition in the title. They said, it's not computer vision. It's not computer vision of emotion. So I thought, OK, I'm going to try a different tact. I'm going to um, put the title of the conference in the paper. So the next paper was on digital affective signal processing, and it went to the digital signal processing conference. Guess what? It got accepted. <laughs> they couldn't say it didn't fit. Same for the affective wearables paper. Um, and then, because getting published was excruciatingly slow and my tenure clock was ticking, and I was in the media lab where they encouraged crazy things, I wrote a book called Affective Computing, uh, which led to what is today a whole field called affective computing. I had no idea it was going to even like just not get totally laughed off of the shelves. Uh, and today, there's an um, IEEE journal of transactions of affective computing and international society, international conferences. Uh, and people who laughed about what I was doing at those conferences have come back to me and asked for my data. Uh, and they're working on it now, too. So I stuck with something that the science was showing me was important, um, even though it involved uh, overcoming a lot of fear of being laughed at and moving forward. In the end, I think uh, that failure is a midpoint. It's not a destination. And you can push through it, keeping your eye on something that's greater than yourself. And I believe that there is something much greater than all of us that gives our lives purpose and meaning and gives our failures sometimes even greater purpose and meaning than we can ever imagine. And sometimes we don't see it. Sometimes we're looking for something big, uh, but sometimes that purpose and meaning works through very little things, even a little centipede. Thank you. <laughs>